You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Hey guys. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio <laughs> Fiction Magazine. Why do you laugh? <laughs> Volume 2, number 3, page 25. I am Rish Outfield. And uh, I'm Big Anklevich. R080T. Now, does he hate it when I say his full name? Like when my mom would say, Richelieu Benjamin Outfield, when I was a little kid? Or do, do, does he does he have feelings at all? I think he got... No, he, he sent away for the feeling chip, but it hasn't been installed yet. So no, he doesn't have feelings yet. That's funny because the douchebag chip seems to have been installed a long time ago. Yeah, that would actually come standard. <laughs> All right, and also with us today, making a special appearance. Yeah, whatever you say, guys. Announcer man, welcome to the fold. Hey, why, why is that a special appearance? He's here all the time, even when he's not here. Because he's special, you know. Oh, he just made quotes in the air, folks. Why did I even show up today? That's unkind. It is unkind. Uh-huh. You are appreciated, announcer man. Well, why do you say this to me? Well, just because somebody mocked us recently and it hurt. Sir? I think he's moved. Has nobody ever appreciated an announcer man before? Probably not. Huh. It's probably never going to happen again. Yeah. Well, I guess today's episode is Excision by Scott H. Andrews. About the author. Scott H. Andrews lives in Virginia with his wife, two cats, nine guitars, a dozen overflowing bookcases, and hundreds of beer bottles from all over the world. His short fiction has appeared in Crossed Genres, the Briarcliff Review, and Space and Time. He is editor-in-chief and publisher of the pro-rate fantasy e-zine Beneath Ceaseless Skies. Excision originally appeared in Anne Vandermeer's first issue of Weird Tales. For more on Scott's stories and his magazine, visit his website at scotthandrews.com. Today's story was produced and edited by Nicole Suddeth. Thanks so much for your help, Nicole. And we'd also like to thank Marie Brennan for her narration and Kate Baker and Carrie Watson for voicing characters in this story. Today's music is by Frozen Silence, and some sound effects were provided by freesound.org. Excision by Scott H. Andrews The young guardsman hobbled out of the gatehouse to meet me, the stag's leg grafted to his left hip, tapping on the cobbles. When he spotted my crimson vivamancer's robes, he waved me ahead. Right on, ma'am. Hold. The guardsman sergeant called. He stepped in front of my palfrey, blocking the way with his right arm, a shaggy bare foreleg that ended in a wide paw. The graft looked old, from his smooth movement and the tufts of bear fur that had spread to his neck. The sergeant shot the guardsman a taut glare. I don't care if someone's wearing robes hammered with yellow gold. You still check their writ. The guards hadn't been nearly this strict when I was a novitiate, but that was nine years ago, before the war. The young guardsman flushed. Uh, Your writ, ma'am, if you please. I pulled the dean's scroll from my robes. I'd read it so many times I could have recited it aloud. I'd been appointed to the faculty of the Regal Academy. For some reason, they found me worthy to join my famed mentor, Scholastiasla. I would be developing new grafting techniques that might heal thousands. Instead of crawling through a tent from one dying man to the next, mopping up globs of pus, gagging from the stench as fathers and husbands and sons begged me to somehow cure their hopeless infections. After the guardsmen returned my scroll, the sergeant took my palfrey's bridle and led me to the inner gate, past a mounted noble. Thank you, sergeant, I said. He patted my palfrey's neck with his bushy paw. A young lad in those same robes gave me this arm. Seven years back. Every month I toss a pebble in the blessing fountain for him. You ought to offer a few pebbles for the scholasts at the academy. They taught that young man how to graft. I'm sure they did, ma'am. But that lad stuck this paw on my stump by moonlight, after his lantern burned out. So I'll save my pebbles for him. I rode through the silent streets, passing only children, mothers, and hunched old men. No aromas of fresh corn or brined ham hock in the market lane, like those I remembered only the starchy odor of beets. 
I'd meant to visit Skolas Jiazla four years ago, after her daughter was killed in an Uthran offensive. A year later, her husband died when the tower he was rebuilding collapsed. And last month, I wept when I heard that Lane, her only son, had taken mortal wounds on his first day at the lines. In the square below the cathedral, I bought four blessing pebbles from a blind monk and slipped them into the waters of the fountain. All I had left of my dear Amant was a wrinkled letter from the lead vivamancer of his unit. I could recite that scroll from memory, too. I dismounted at the gate to the academy and peered into the quadrangle. The worn colonnades of sooty stone hadn't changed at all. I felt tiny again, standing next to pillars three hundred years old. How did I belong on the same faculty as Skolas Giazla? Vivamancers had long been able to replace amputated limbs, sealing the graft with a transfer of vita from the donor animal, but most grafts turned septic. My mentor discovered the eddies of necrotia present in all wounds. If the vivamancer removed that infectious energy before sealing a graft, the chance of sepsis plunged. Her innovation had saved ten thousand lives. Yet the Nuthran hordes still swarmed our border, their barbaric examancers draining Vita from our wounded to heal their own. The impassive steward checked my scroll. Skullis Jazla left word, ma'am, to call on her the instant you arrived. After the loss of her family, my mentor must have been longing to see an old acquaintance. I left my palfrey with a servant and hurried across the quadrangle. Dry leaves rustled over the brick walkways. I mounted the worn marble stairs of Academy Hall. The top floor smelled strongly of vinegar and faintly of dead tissue, just as I remembered. I swept past Skolas Giazla's office. She was always in her laboratory. Stray specks of sunlight filtered through the black paper masking the laboratory windows. The tables were piled with books and dissection pans and jars of translucent solutions that reflected the lamplight in distended waves. The odor of infected flesh hung in the air, stronger than I recalled. A short, wispy figure toddled out from behind a laboratory bench, and I winced. My famed mentor had lost a handspan of height to stooped shoulders and a hump at the top of her back. Deep furrows hung down the sides of her nose, but her eyes still shone with eager intensity. Medi, she said in the exact same strident voice I remembered. She rushed to embrace me. I patted her gently on the back, below her bony hump. It's good to see you, Skolest. Won't have that. You're ten years graduated, Medi. Call me Lucheza. Very well, Skolest, I said reflexively. She frowned gently as she shuffled back to her bench. Glad you're finally here. Been expecting you all day. I ought to have come years ago. I'm so sorry about Lane. She stared past me at a picture frame beside the door. The amber wood was carved in a design of rolling waves, with dolphins and mermen frolicking in the surf. But the empty frame enclosed only the rough, bare planks of the wall. Her gaze never left the frame. The youngest apprentice, the Doretzka, master woodcarver ever took. I remember. As a boy, Lane would sit and whittle in the hallway. She scolded him for scattering shavings across the floor, and I often helped him sweep them up. One day he gave me a tiny bird carved from soft white wood. I wish I'd kept it. Glad you're here, Skolas Giazla said again. I need your help with something I'm working on. Of course, Skolas, uh, Lucheza. I'll help you in any way I can. But can we sit a moment first? My legs are aching from the stirrups. Her face softened. I'm sorry. I've tea in my office. I followed her across the hallway. Her office smelled dank, like a tent the morning after someone slept in it. The desk lay buried under open books and unrolled scrolls. Skolas Giazla sat, then waved me to the cot along the wall. She thumped dust out of a second mug and poured two cups of tea from a copper lab flask. Those two infections you cured last month. You read my field report? Those infections. In the desert heat, the stench of sepsis had steamed off both men so thickly it made my eyes water. They came in on the same day with infections that had spread from failed grafts, one on the back of his shoulder, the other on his hip. I couldn't amputate so close to the body core, and the infections were too advanced to waste a donor animal on a transfer of Vita. I sawed off their grafts. Then I drained the necrotia from their stumps so I could seal them with some camel skin. The necrotia was much stronger than in a usual stump. After I absorbed it, the pain was so severe I couldn't sit up. The next morning, both infections had started to heal, and it all made sense. The necrotia I removed wasn't the normal traces from a raw stump. It was the rampant energy from the nearby infections. Skolas Giazla peered at me over her mug. The next time? She knew I must have tried it again. I'd left that out of my report. I couldn't bring myself to write it. A vivamancer, with a punctured stomach. 
The necrotia was much deeper. I couldn't pull it out. I told Ahmad I'd only healed those men by accident, but he mustered his angular grin and clutched my hand. He said he knew I could cure his infection. After I failed, he tried to comfort me, but his last smile was forced and hollow. My failure had wounded him far worse than the infection. He died that night. Skolas Jazza gazed past me, her mug dangling from her hand. I took a gulp of my tea. What are you working on? A method to graft to the torso? A cure for systemic infection. I jerked back on the rickety cot. If she discovered how to remove infections that had spread to the body's core, she would save another 10,000 lives, which might even end the war. I wish I could help, but I have no idea how I cured those men. You've already made the breakthrough, Medi. Just have to figure out how you did it. I remember the wounded outside the field station, laid across stacks of dead because the ground was already covered. I didn't feel as though I'd made any breakthrough. Skolas Giazla started asking me about the other two men. I'd already considered the simple connections. Were their grafts attached at the same field station, by the same vivimancer? But her questions were more subtle. Had the men been wounded in the same battle, by the same type of weapon? I saw the ideas she was exploring, and I tried to reach beyond them. Soon I was offering questions, too. Skolas Giazla slid forward in her chair, nodding vigorously. Perhaps I was her colleague after all. With her help, I might figure out my breakthrough, and how to replicate it. They were brought in together, I said, but from different units. Time of day? Early afternoon. Skolas Giazla jolted upright. Was it hot? It was always hot. But that week, the heat was so severe three of our camels died. Yes. The stomach wound. Was it hot then? Amand. No, he came in at night. Fever? They all had fever. The first two men were also red and flushed. Their skin felt as hot as sunburn. Skolas Giazla hopped to her feet. Fever helps the body's vita resist an infection. And their body temperature was even higher from the heat. That must have loosened the necrotia in their infections. Enough that it pulled away when you drained their stumps. I stood. You have samples prepared? We could reproduce that external heat with a hot water bath. Yes. Skolas Giazla rushed for the door. Knew you could help when I read your report. Glad you took the post. I recommended you. I hid my flushed face as I hurried after her. Now I truly was her colleague. I'd witnessed her previous breakthrough, but this time I'd provided the key that might lead to another. We started immediately. Skolas Giazla had a series of rabbits she'd infected by treating their grafts with offal. I selected the most advanced sample, a brown-spotted one with a cat-striped forepaw, to perform the control. I closed my eyes and pressed my palm to the rabbit's warm shoulder. I focused on the weak energy simmering in its body, and the spherical image of its vita appeared in my mind. A foreign strand wriggled across the round core, the necrotia from the infection. I reached my mind forward to grab it, but I couldn't get a firm hold. I tried twice, with no success. We couldn't use the control animal again or we would compromise the trials. So I extracted all the remaining Vita to extinguish the rabbit. The rush of energy swirled in my head. I felt a pang of shame as I remembered the Nuthan Eximancers in their white shrouds. Those savages had no laws forbidding the draining of Vita from living beings, even humans. We only used Vivomancy to save people's lives. I prepared the first trial with a hot water bath. The feverish rabbit fell unconscious after a minute in the water. Skolas Giazla lowered her knobby hand to its shoulder above the septic graft. The sinews quivered in her wrist. She finally broke contact with a strangled gas. The rabbit stirred awake. The red puckered skin above the graft had faded to a hale pink, and the rabbit pawed at the rim of the bath. Breathless hope broke over Skolas Giazla's face. I was so excited I nearly dropped the rabbit as I slipped it back into its cage. Three more trials, including one I performed, all showed the same improvement. We needed to wait overnight to confirm we'd fully removed the infections, but it was still the first ever reproducible excision of systemic sepsis. We crossed back to our office. Night had fallen outside the window. My chest throbbed from the necrotia I'd absorbed, a pinpoint of agony above my stomach. But with food and rest, I would recover. Skolas Jasla plopped down in her chair. Well done, Medi, she whispered. Thank you, Lucheza. My first day at my new post, and I'd begun experiments that might save as many lives as hers had. I pulled the curtains closed. Where shall we start tomorrow? Skolas Giazla stirred awake in her chair. She'd already fallen asleep. I clasped her bony hand. 
I'll take you back to the faculty wing. She yanked her fingers through my grasp. No. Of course, her quarters still bristled with memories of her family. How could I have been so callous? You can sleep in my quarters as long as you like. She lurched to her cot. I'll stay here. To keep an eye on the rabbits. The poor woman had saved thousands, but this office and her laboratory were all she had left. I draped the rumpled blanket over her. I'll have the servants leave you a bowl of broth in the hallway. She instantly fell back asleep. I thought her face might ease into the calm I'd seen on healed soldiers. Instead, her crinkled cheeks twitched as she slept. I left word with the night servant, then stepped into the chilly quadrangle. A cluster of novitiates hurried across the sparse lawn, their faces so smooth and oblivious. Now that we had solved my breakthrough, perhaps those young faces would never see a mountain of bodies, blackened and swollen by the desert sun. I stumbled from the faculty quarters at dawn and raced across the quadrangle to Academy Hall. All four of the rabbit subjects had improved dramatically. Their swelling was down and their color had returned. I rushed across the hall. Skolas Jasla was still asleep, clutching a woodcut to her chest. The carved relief showed a woman in windswept robes helping a man with a grafted leg rise to his feet. I slipped it from her fingers and set it carefully aside. She sputtered awake, her face ashen. She still hadn't recovered from draining all that necrotia even a morning later. I helped her to a seat on her cot and described the subjects. Excellent, she rasped. Next trials. I've got a tub that'll hold a man. You want to go straight to a human? She planted her hands on the edge of the cot and pushed herself to her feet. Must know if it works. She'd never rushed trials like this, even for her famous breakthrough. But she'd lost her entire family. We have to test it on a larger animal first. She gave a dazed nod. Right away. I'll help you after I meet with the dean. I didn't get a chance to see him yesterday. Maddie. She stared right at me. Tiny crusts of dried tears hung at the corners of her eyes. This can't wait. I didn't want it to wait. I didn't want anyone else to watch their loved ones shiver and drool for days as sepsis finally took them. I didn't want to see Amon's hollow grin anymore every time I fell asleep. I followed Skolas Jasla into the laboratory. It took an hour for the servants to heat enough water to fill Skolas Jasla's tub. In the last row of cages, I found two infected dogs and a ram, all with stubby forelegs grafted from swine. The first dog was so weak it couldn't sit up in the tub. I turned a bowl upside down in the water for it to rest its head on. Its wide brown eyes followed me across the room. Once the heat had boosted its fever, Skolas Jasla stooped and laid her palm on the dog's shoulder. A sheen of rigid concentration spread over her face. Her wrist shivered. Then she swayed forward and slumped against the water bath. I hooked my arms under her shoulders and carried her to a chair. When I was a novitiate, she was always darting about the laboratory, helping three or four of us with our grafts at once. Now, as I let her shoulder go, I expected her to tip out of the chair. But she stayed upright. Couldn't pull it away. Wrapped too tight. You try. I will, Lucheza. As soon as I get you back to your cot. She stiffened. No, I'll stay here. To help you. She'd been practicing vivomancy longer than I'd been alive. I couldn't argue. I lowered my hand to the dog. The necrotia from the sepsis writhed around the dog's vita like a vine choking a shrub. The increased body temperature hadn't loosened it at all. Had the infection spread too far for the heat to affect it? I pulled, but the necrotia would not bunch. The infection must be too advanced. Skolas Jasla's face tightened. Next one. I extinguished the dog, then repeated the trial with the ram. The necrotia was even deeper. I couldn't peel it away. Was the water not hot enough? Had I done some tiny thing differently on the rabbits? Skolas Jasla had dozed off in her chair. I didn't want to wake her without any results, so I extinguished the ram and performed yet another control on a rabbit. It worked, so my approach was sound. I lowered the last dog into the tub. Ripples shimmered across the water from its faint breath. I laid my hand on its chest, just below the puckered swine foreleg. The necrotia was just as tightly entwined. I had to make this work. I pressed my other palm to the dog's flank and tugged with all my mental strength. My head ached with strain. Amon's dying hand seized my arm again. The necrotia ripped free, tearing loose great hunks of the dog's vita with it. I yanked my hand away. The dog's life winked out right before me. Its head slid off the bowl into the water. 
Why hadn't these trials worked? I worried I'd made some foolish mistake, but the control proved I hadn't. There was some fundamental barrier to this process in the larger animals. Someone must have left a hundred blessing pebbles for those two men I'd cured. They were a fluke we couldn't reproduce. My breakthrough had vanished. I wouldn't save a thousand lives. I wouldn't keep any novitiates from gagging on the stench of war, and I wouldn't save any feverish men from a sweaty, agonizing death. I was back outside the field station, screening the wounded. Staunch men, raised on farms as I'd been, pleading with me because they recognized my accent, dying in the sun because I had to treat the officers and nobles first. Skolas Giazla woke with a start. The subjects. I knelt beside her chair. It won't work, Lucheza. It might be their larger mass or the higher volume per surface area. Maybe we can't get close enough to their core energies from our limited area of contact. I don't know. But it's not going to work on anything larger, such as a man. Water wasn't hot enough. No, I checked that. You didn't do it right. How could she say such a thing when she trained me herself? I explained my additional control. It must work. She sputtered. It worked in the desert. But we don't know why. This protocol couldn't replicate it in the larger animals. We need to start again with a new approach. We can't exclude these trials and jump ahead merely because we think it ought to work. She herself had taught me that. Now she was so worn down, I had become the instructor. She exhaled a long breath that seemed to leave her shrunken. We could try it together. I jerked away. Multiple vivamances contacting a subject at once was expressly forbidden by the laws of our discipline. In the unschooled age before the academy, shared contact had killed some vivamancers and left others permanently addled. Absolutely not. Why would she even suggest such a thing? Then we need a better small subject. She staggered to the door and called for the servant. Perhaps a different subject would help us find the limits of this protocol. After Skolas Gialsla spoke to the servant, she returned to her chair. Her face looked oddly numb, as though she were asleep, but with her eyes still open. A quarter hour later, the servant rapped on the door. Skolas Gialsla shot to her feet. Our subject. A lean woman in a filthy cloak shuffled into the laboratory. In the bundle of blankets clutched to her chest, a baby wailed. mother thrust her screaming baby at Skolas Gialsla. You footman said you could help my son. Can you? Can you help him? Skolas Gialsla looked away as she steered the mother to the laboratory bench. Yes. Set him down. Medi? I dragged Skolas Gialsla aside. We can't do this. We have no idea if this protocol will work on a human. And you don't have the dean's approval for a human trial. That woman cares about approval. She doesn't care where she'll find tomorrow's food. Only if she'll get enough today to keep nursing for another week. You healed those rabbits. This child's no larger. You can do this, Medi. I shivered. The last person who told me that had died before the next dawn. The woman peered at me, her face taut with hope. Can you help my son? Please tell me you can. A tiny whimper sounded, deep in Skolas Gialsla's chest. Yes. I crossed to the bench. The baby's stomach was distended and streaks of red stretched up his chest. His wispy hair was matted with sweat. Skolas Gialsla filled the small water bath, and I lowered the baby inside. His skin itched with heat against my fingers. I eased his pudgy arms out of the way and pressed my hand to his belly. The baby's veto was tiny, no bigger than a fist. The dark strand of necrotia from the infection thrashed on the surface. I reached for it. The mother sucked breath through clenched teeth. Skolas Gialsla bumped my arm, leaning close. I steadied my focus and reached again. The vibrations of the baby's cries pulsed against my hand. I plucked the strand loose and edged it away. The necrotia uncurled from his vita like a string pulled from mud. Then it slithered inside my body, constricting inside my chest. I grabbed the edge of the bench until the pain subsided. The mother instantly recognized a change in her son's cries. She scooped him wet and naked to her face and swamped him with weepy kisses. Thank you. Thank you. She said. Thank you. I dabbed at my eyes. You're welcome. He ought to improve even more by tomorrow. The mother emptied her pouch onto the bench and shoved it all at me. One gold retic, a worn blessing pebble, and a brass corporal's clasp. I'm so sorry there's not more. Skolas Gialsla gathered everything back into the pouch. She wrapped the baby in his swaddling and tucked the pouch inside a fold. I passed him back to his mother. See that he eats. I will. Thank you. 
The mother bowed repeatedly as she left. Scolastiazzo stared at the door long after it had closed. I stumbled to the chair. It had worked, after all. We could cure systemic infection in babies and perhaps small children. The limit for this protocol was the size of the subject. It had certainly worked for that mother. I wouldn't save a thousand lives, but I had saved the one that mattered to her. No one had appreciated my work like that in quite some time. Thank you, I said to Scholastiazla, for pushing me. She still clung to the table, her knuckles white. Silent tears dribbled down her cheeks. Lucheza? She turned slowly, as though she'd heard me from far away. Her face shook like she was biting off a sob. I staggered to her side and put my arm around her bony shoulders. I'm so sorry Lane is gone. If I could bring him back to you, I would. She flinched. Her head swung up and fixed me with a wan stare. She grabbed my arm so tightly that I fought not to cry out. Then she steered me toward the rear of the laboratory. I followed Skolestiazla past the empty cages to the dim, cluttered rear alcove. The distant lamplight from behind us glinted off a tarnished brass door. She pulled a key from a dirty scrap of twine around her neck and opened it. A fetid stench hung so thickly in the darkness that I could taste it on the air. She struck a spark to a lantern. The light spilled over a narrow bed holding a gaunt young man. His red-splotched cheeks were motionless, but breath still hissed in his chest. Crusted bandages covered the stumps of both his knees, below tufts of coarse fur. His bare shoulder glistened with sweat, down to the swollen mass of his right hand. His face was a puffy mockery of the skilled young woodcarver I had known ten years ago. Lane was alive. I felt worse than if he'd died. Skolas Jasla dipped a cloth in a bowl of turbid water and dabbed at her son's forehead, but he barely stirred. They took his legs, she said, her voice warbling. But I wouldn't let them take his hand. His carving hand. I couldn't. Infection spread up his arm, through his chest. Leg grafts went septic before I could get him here. My empty stomach surged up the back of my throat. Then how... how is he still alive, three weeks later? I didn't know how to isolate the necrotia, so I extracted it, along with his vita, in small amounts, to keep them balanced, so the infection wouldn't take him. I grabbed the rim of the doorway to steady myself, killing her own son a bit at a time, to keep him alive. An oblivious sheen coated her face, the brilliance I'd aspired to, that I thought I'd achieved just a day before had vanished from her eyes. She wasn't doing these experiments to save lives or to end the war. She was doing them for herself to free her son from the horrible decision she'd made. She arranged Lane's bandaged stumps on the stained sheets. I know how to isolate it now, thanks to you. Help me with this trial, Medi. You must. Scolest, he's far too large. It won't work. We must try. It is all he has left. I wanted to help her. I wanted Lane to wake up and squeeze her hand. I wanted that mask of numb sorrow on her face to dissolve into relief and joy. Perhaps there was something specific to the larger animals that had affected those trials. It had worked on the baby. Wouldn't we eventually need to try this protocol on a man? I'd already saved one mother's son. If I was ever going to save a thousand more, I had to start with Lane. Maddie? She whispered. I swallowed. I'll prepare the water. It took both of us to lift Lane into the tub. His head lolled on the upside-down bowl I had set there for the dog. The bandages from his stumps dangled in the water, trailing dark crimson specks. He groaned as I poured in the steaming water. Not so quickly, Skolas Giazla snapped. She knelt at the side of the tub. I dove past her and took Lane's head before she could ask me to perform this experiment on her only son. His neck throbbed with heat against my fingertips. Skolas Giazla paused a moment, staring through her son. Then she reached both hands to his chest. A muscle quivered in her neck. Her eyes twitched beneath their baggy lids. Got hold of it. Need to get closer. Her son shook in the water. I tightened my grip. My palm pressed flat to his neck and energies gushed into my mind. His vita glimmered like a sheet of fading embers. A thick, foreign strand trailed from the core. 
I snapped my mind from his body. I felt sick that I had violated the first law of our discipline, even by accident. But the infection's necrotia was already peeling away. Did we actually have a chance? Skolas Gielsla's hand slipped on her son's chest. She was losing contact. She ought to have loosened the whole strand by now, but she wasn't strong enough to excise it. I should have done the experiment. I'd let her do it, but not because it was her son and her idea to press ahead. Because I was scared. Because I thought I would fail again. Because I didn't want to see another harrowing grin in my sleep. I couldn't let Skolas Gielsla fail in my place. I grabbed Lane's neck with both my hands. The foreign strand still trailed from the faint core. It looked thinner now, so Skolas Gyazla must have drawn most of it off. But she'd run out of strength. I grabbed the strand with my mind. It split away from the core in a burst of energy. I fell backwards, and Lane's head plopped onto the upside-down bowl. Had we saved him? My mind swelled with euphoria. Strangely, I felt no pain from the necrotia I'd excised. Skolas Gyazla collapsed behind the tub. Her arms flopped at her sides as I rolled her over. Her face was pasty gray. She must have extracted nearly all the necrotia before I'd entered her son's body. I crawled back to the tub. Lane's cheeks were still splotched with red, spittle still oozed from the corner of his mouth. Even with such a severe infection, we should have seen some improvement. He looked as though he hadn't removed any necrotia at all. What of that foreign strand? A dry moan sounded at the base of the tub, and Skolas Gyazla wheezed for breath. That foreign strand had been her Vita. And the entire faint core was the infection's necrotia. She couldn't remove it, so she tried to keep Lane alive by giving him her own Vita. And I'd ripped it away. I'd killed her. In the most vile and barbaric manner any Vivamancer could imagine. It didn't matter that she was sacrificing herself. I was trying to save her son, and Amand, and those rural soldiers, and a thousand other men I'd never met. And myself. I'd completely forgotten about her. I leaned over the rim of the tub and vomited into the steamy water. Lane? Skolas Gyazla croaked. Hope flickered across her face. I wiped my mouth and forced a smile. His color is already returning. She sighed and a gray pallor ebbed from her cheeks. Then her eyes went glassy and a last breath escaped her lips. I reached down to Lane. Pitiful gasps scraped in his chest. I had to end his agony. But I couldn't violate another law of our discipline, no matter how horribly he was suffering. So I slipped the upside-down bowl from under his head. The water covered his face, and flecks of my vomit floated over his nose. Bubbles rose from his mouth. But only a few. I held his hand as he died. His mother had tried everything to save him. She must have known that even a transfer of all her own Vita wouldn't cure his infection. But she'd hoped against what she knew. I had, too. The servants wrapped Skolas Gyazla and her son from head to toe, then sent for the city embalmer's wagon. I wrote a report of her final breakthrough, a cure for systemic sepsis in small children. It wouldn't save any men, but it would save thousands of babies, so they could grow into men and die on the battlefield, or perhaps one of them would become a vivimancer and discover how to remove systemic infections from adults. I hoped so. I left the report with the dean, along with my letter of resignation. On the morning of Skolas Gyalzla's state funeral, I rode out of the city. I didn't deserve to stand in the cathedral beside her body when I was the one who'd ripped out her life. At the east gate, the sergeant with the bare arm was again in command. He pulled my palfrey from the line of carts and escorted me through. Is the academy posting you outside the city, ma'am? No. Actually, I'm headed back to the lines. Keep your head low out there. I always do. I'll toss a pebble in the fountain for you tonight as well, ma'am. If you don't mind. Thank you. No, I don't mind. I don't mind at all. Could I become the sort of vivimancer a soldier would remember every month with a blessing pebble? Perhaps the way to save a thousand lives was to treat each man as that sergeant's vivimancer had treated him, applying practiced knowledge with fearless persistence. If it took that, I would never save half so many. But I could try. Author's note. Hi, I'm Scott H. Andrews, the author of Excision. 
This story grew out of several things that are frequent elements in my writing. Characters who are in emotionally difficult situations and strange but vivid fantasy worlds. I like the conflict of characters dealing with tough emotions, like Medi's somberness at returning to the Academy after so many years, and both her and Scholast Gyazla's grief at the loss of their loved ones in the war. I often end up with at least one character in each of my stories who responds to the drive of those emotions by doing something drastic, like Scholast Gyazla does in Excision, and I like showing the consequences of those kinds of actions. I love fantasy worlds that are strange in some neat way, but that are also gritty and visceral, that feel real as I'm reading stories set in them. The grafting of animal limbs onto humans, I thought, fit with the war-torn state of this particular country. I liked having Medi's profession be related to that grafting, so the reader could learn more about it. The scientific way the grafting magic was presented was natural for me, because I'm a chemistry lecturer. So once I had the core emotions for the main characters and the vivid strangeness for the world, I put the characters under some pressure and let their emotions drive them to do drastic things. I hope you enjoyed the story that resulted. All right, welcome back, everybody. What? Nothing. All right. (laughs) You, You talk for a minute. Thanks for listening to the story. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. You know, a story this much of a downer. Is it fair to ask if people enjoyed it? You know, that's an interesting question. Can did you, s- you enjoy Schindler's List? Yeah. Can you say that you enjoyed something that's really tragic or not? I don't know. How about Barbie Schindler's List? I liked Barbie Schindler's List, to tell you the truth. She was so perky and chipper and willing to sacrifice. Okay, so yeah, just let me get it out. In the open right now, the the elephant in the room. This story bummed me out, dude. <laughs> and when you first sent it to me, I think it's fair to say that I whined and I I, I said this is the most depressing, <laughs> downbeat, sad, heartbreaking, unpleasant thing that you've ever asked me to accept. And you responded with, "I know we've done downbeat stories before. This is no worse than Aqualung." Or mm-hmm. the better teleportation theory. Walk It After Midnight that we just did a couple weeks back. That story is all about basically the main character dying. When we did that story, I thought, wow, that's really similar to Aqualung. What about... In some ways. You know, we had Revolving Door where the guy, the old guy, goes to the fantasy world and, and then he's never able to go back. And at the very, very end of the story... He dies, you know, he he gets to go back there in, in death. At least that's how I interpreted the story. Huh. It, wait, is that not how it I don't know. I thought he was just finally able to go back again. I didn't think that he had to go in death. We didn't see that he was dead anywhere. You know, another story by the same author, if you want to go for one that's really depressing, is Pete Tuzinski's uh, Into Silence Like a Shout, which was the story we used to end our very first issue. It was the last story of our first issue, and that was the one where the the moon is crashing down into the planet, and these and these fantasy archetypes get together and like come to terms with their impending doom, and there's no way to stop it. Then the moon crashes down and kills everyone. Yeah, still not <laughs> even remotely as bleak. Not as, as bleak, huh? And I whined about it. I I, I guess it, it set me up for a hope. That never paid off, uh-huh. which may sound like a criticism of the story. And I, hey, I don't mean to do that. And and you know what? That's something we've talked about with unhappy endings. Is in our society we're so spoon fed that everything ha- works out, everybody lives right. happily ever after. Maybe we don't open ourselves up to the possibility that things will end tragically or badly or uh-huh. at all. But yeah, it just felt really sad. Yeah, it is definitely a depressing story, but uh, I think there's a lot of really cool things to go along with that, though. Just the world itself was really interesting. It was different than other things that I that I've seen out there. You know, I, that's one thing that I think we've mentioned before: just the effort that it would take for an author to invent an entire fantasy world that seems deep enough. That you can believe that this is a real world. There's there's enough to it that you can say, yeah, okay. I 
can suspend my disbelief and say, yeah, this is a real world. It takes a lot of details and a lot of uh, work to go in behind that. I really was interested in the way that the magic worked in this and ho the whole, you know, being able to see into someone's life force and, and see the bad thing that was wrapped around it and that's what you had to remove and I liked the way it worked. You know, then of course he took that and messed with it a bit and had the, the scholist who was doing things the wrong way and and then our main character, you know, reached in there trying to heal and wound up killing the woman, which is a pretty tragic thing but in a way it was kind of a, a, a beautiful story too about this mother who loved her son so much that she actually gave of her own life to uh, keep her son alive in the end it didn't work out because you know some things they're just gonna end badly if you break some rules no matter how lovingly you do it it's not gonna turn out okay i just started watching house house md just from the very beginning. Oh, yeah. And you've ever watched it? You know the show? Yeah, I've seen a fair amount of episodes. Like, I saw that one where there was the person and he came in and he had that, like, the problem with him. And nobody could figure out what it was. And they were all confused. And then right at the end, House figured it out just in time. It was... Did you see that one? That's a really good episode. <laughs> <coughs> that That is the template oh. for every episode. Oh, so it's like that a lot. And... I complained to my friend that was lending me his DVDs that I thought, you know, I, I think I would, I, I would like them to fail just once, you know. I would like them to not succeed, not figure out what it is, just to see how that would affect the characters. Mm -hmm. and, that, and also to make it real, mm -hmm. to make you feel like, okay, hey, they may not save this person. And it did happen. Yeah. It's happened on more than one occasion, but the huh. first time it happened... I was like, oh, no, no, it really freaked me out. <laughs> it was a thing that I had wanted to happen. And then when it happened, I regretted ever since. <laughs> Although, I mean, I don't think I influenced these episodes that were it already was, on the DVD in fault. my hand. You've got to be careful with that kind of stuff. I was going to say, if you didn't ever get around to saying, oh, that one time it actually did happen, I was going to say, yeah, if it did happen, then they would have had to change the name of the show to ER. Because that happens a lot on that show. ER is very realistic. And granted, they have like 10 patients per episode, but they don't save them all every single time. And I swear that's the world's most depressing show. My wife loved to watch it, and at a certain point, I finally said, you know, I can't watch this with you because I'm going to go hang myself. Zing! Around the time this episode hits, that new Harrison Ford movie comes out. Uh, Extraordinary Measures, is that what it's called? Okay. It's hard to even remember. I don't but know. There's a lot of movies with, like, desperate measures, extraordinary means. Extreme uh, measures. Extreme measures. You know, see? And, yeah, basically it's a father has these two kids that suddenly come down with some kind of disease that only Dr. House can diagnose. <laughs> no, uh, but there's some disease that's un incurable. It's uncurable, it's, which is way worse than incurable. Ooh. So he goes to Harrison Ford, who is this researcher who was at one time working on that and, you know, he's been disgraced or something like that. And it's just like, please, you got to save my kids. And it's based on a true story. And so my mom saw the trailer and she's like, oh, that's based on a true story. She's like, I sure hope those children survive. And I was like, Ma, of course they survive. <laughs> well, you think they would make a movie about it if those two kids die? I mean, come on. So your point is? No, no, no. I, I, my opinion was that, of course, those kids are saved because we're not brainwashed, but we're, we're conditioned to expect that in a movie. Of course uh -huh. it's going to be a feel-good movie. Of course they're going to heal the kid. They're, it's not like they're going to find little Adam Walsh's head. It's going to have a happy ending. That, that we, that's just what we expect. Mm -hmm. A lot of people criticize Joss Whedon for doing that. That's one of his great strengths in my mind, is that he does occasionally kill somebody that you love, and he, he doesn't pull his punches. Yeah. But people say, oh, yeah, it's just like a Joss Whedon show. They killed so-and-so. So maybe you can do it too much, or maybe <laughs> people just sour on that. When we were at Comic-Con, didn't he say something like that exactly? Yeah, one of the questions was at that dollhouse panel that we went to, somebody said, so who are you going to kill first? And Joss said... He said, whoever you like most. 
and we've talked about this before, that's probably one of, like you said, one of his big strengths because it makes every story that he tells, whatever show it is that he's on, you truly worry for these characters because you know that it's happened before. People have died. They're not invincible. It's not like Scooby-Doo where they're all going to come back and it's going to be the same thing it was, as it was the week before. Scrappy did get that sulfuric acid poured on him, though, in that third season. That was good, uh, too. Scooby-Doo, it's... where are you? Where... Uh, he died rather roughly. I felt like for a, an early 70s cartoon, that was really graphic. But, you know, everybody wanted that to happen. Nobody likes Scrappy-Doo. No, I agree. I, if you do like Scrappy, then you're an asshole. I think Rish is right. They liked them less than people liked Scooby-D and Scooby-Dum. I think Big is right. What is Scooby-D and Scooby-Dum? <laughs> they were the spinoff characters in Alice in Wonderland? <laughs> <laughs> they were just some dumb cousins or something. I don't remember exactly, but they were... Maybe they didn't exist at all. Maybe I made that up. Rambling! Oh, sorry, you're right. There is power in doing the unexpected thing, in doing something that you don't imagine. Not giving the pre-packaged happy ending every time. Yeah, it shows people that you're not messing around. Now, would I have preferred if she been able to save her son? Hell yeah. <laughs> but that probably shows that it was a well-written story and that you cared about the character. That's right. In this particular story, I mean, we had both the mother and the son pass away in the end. Could have thrown us a bone and that one of them make it out somehow. But in the end, did our main character learn something or did she move on to a better time in life. I don't know that things are going to be better for this woman down the road. I guess in the process of their experiments and so forth, they did discover a way to save babies that were infected, and that's good. Everybody likes to save babies. But it is definitely good to go both ways. If you always do depressing endings, you might want to try throwing in a happy one every now and then. Well, and is that, that's why you stopped watching ER is because there was just too Yeah, many. that show was depressing every single week. Oh, I couldn't save that poor dying child or I couldn't save that old man. There was always a, I couldn't save them. Somebody sitting out on the back porch smoking and staring off into the snow and wanting to shoot themselves. At a certain point, I had to I had to quit. So, you know, I think there definitely needs to be a ratio of happy versus sad endings. And the happy needs to be on the upside of that ratio. The three Batman movies that I think are the best are the three that have either Pyrrhic victories or, or mixed endings. And I think Dark Knight's ending was just plain unhappy. Right? Yeah, I think so. Of all the, the Batman movies, before Dark Knight came out, the one that most struck me and resonated with me was that bleak, lonely ending of Batman Returns. It was just him and Alfred, and that was all that was left. And it's like, Merry Christmas, Mr. Wayne. Merry Christmas, Alfred. And then the mm -hmm. music played. It was just like, wow, kind of thing. And Batman You did begins. see that the Catwoman was still alive, at least, at the end. Mm -hmm. But they, they weren't together. True. But there's something for next week. I wish I had mentioned Batman Returns. And then Batman Begins, his whole house is gone, his parents' house. Uh-huh. And Rachel's found out his, his secret, and it looks like they can be together, and she's like, no, you know, if, if ever you're not needing to be Batman, maybe we can get together, and she leaves. And I was like, wow, Merry Christmas again, Alfred. <laughs> and then the third one, I've seen it recently. I, I, there's no guarantee that the Joker was even brought to justice. It, it's, it sure seems like the police are going to come get him, but that's an easy out that he might have gotten away. Harvey Dent is dead. Rachel is dead. And everybody points at Batman as the one that did it, the, the, the villain. Yeah. Just in case uh, you're one of the few people that haven't seen it, spoiler alert. Oh, that's kind <laughs> of you to say. Uh, uh, wait, wait, is this for the episode? Well, I don't know. Do you, I mean, is this worth leaving in? You could, yeah, I think. goes along with what we're talking about. It's up to you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean for any of that to be in the episode, but we'll just leave it because it it does. Yeah, it does sort of belong with the, the unhappy thing. I've said it before on the show about like horror movies and the ending of Seven. I, I think a lot of people might like Seven, but people wouldn't revere it and remember it if, if everything had worked out all right in the end. Yeah. Sad, bleak endings. They have their place, definitely. 
There needs to be some vinegar mixed in with the seasonings every now and then. And who doesn't like sweet and sour meatballs anyways? Wait, what? Is, is this a question? Is this something I'm supposed to have an opinion about? What the F for sweet and sour meatballs? Something Wait, was this the episode where we're cursing, or is that next week? That was a different week. Okay. But, uh, yeah, so... No, so you're not going to let us in. Okay, folks, in the comments, please let me know what sweet and sour meatballs are. Something that you can eat. Did you just grab yourself and you said, that? that's not cool. Don't you have anything worthwhile to say? Okay, well, before we play the the thing that people are so excited about. Oh, yes. Please be excited. Can I kill five minutes by telling you, okay, this morning my alarm went off. Uh-huh. And normally I'll hit snooze and go back to sleep immediately okay. because I'm a lazy sack of crap. Yes. This I, Everyone knows, apparently. Yes, sir. As the alarm went off and I reached over to, to snooze it, the DJ was talking about something. And he's like, so please, please go on there and vote for me, please. And I was like, wait, what? And he's like, okay, and now Electric Youth by Debbie Gibson. And they so they played the song, and, and I'm like, uh, do I go to sleep? or? Okay, screw it, and I went back to sleep. But when the alarm went off again, they the song ended, whatever it was, and the DJ comes on again, and he starts talking about this new WB show. Wait, what is the channel called? CWB, WBC, NBC, CW. Me, 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 me. Let the man know what he's won, Donna. So there's this this CW show called Life Unexpected that's really new or was new when made this recording. <laughs> they, I guess they had some kind of contest uh -huh. where you had to vote for your favorite morning DJ. And the one who got the most votes won a walk-on part in an upcoming episode of Life Unexpected. Just yeah, to make an excruciatingly long story short, I said it only take five minutes and it's been 11. He asked people to go on to the CW page or the Life Unexpected uh -huh. page to vote for him. And he says, I'm third from the right. And hurry and go down there and vote for me. And I was just like, eh. and I went and I took my shower. And when I came out, he's like, OK, folks, here's what I want you to do. And all through his shift until he the next guy the came on, time. he asked people to do this, to vote for him. He just wants people to love him and touch me, love me. <laughs> and it started to bother me. At first, I went on there and I was like, OK, I'll check this thing out. And it's the one with the most votes will win. And there's like these big markets with DJs right. and this guy was like number two or number three in some like low level D grade market where we live uh, <laughs> because he'd just been begging and he says, oh, folks, you can vote up to five times a day. So if you'll, you vote all day today and tomorrow and the, the groveling of this guy is it's shameless and it's starting to really irritate me. It's starting to be sad, frankly. Uh -huh. And I thought about that and I thought every week, I guess we're supposed to ask people to donate or ask people to love us or ask people to go onto iTunes and give us five stars or ask people to leave a nice comment or tell a friend something kind about us or put a flower on the grave of Tor Johnson, you know, just something like that. Hey, you, you've heard other podcasts where every week uh -huh. they say – and it's wrote. It's the exact word for word, you know. We need your donations to do this kind of thing. And I wonder if people ever feel the way that I felt about this DJ where I said, you know, it takes a lot for me to call somebody pathetic because <laughs> of who I am. But that's what this thing was. And it's just the, the, the constant shameless begging. It's like, well, if you like me at all, you'll vote <laughs> for me. So I guess you can see where I'm going here. I, I, I don't know if I can do the whole begging for donations uh -huh. every week. But at the same time, I can I can see where this DJ is coming from. I want people to like me. I want people to recognize that we are trying our best on this show or that we do good work or that we're funny or that we're infuriating or offensive or whatever we inferior. are. Inferior. Maybe that's what you're after. I, I don't think anybody's ever called you inferior. <laughs> give, give me your impression. I have the podcasts – where they beg every week. And, and is it begging? But the ones where it's like, oh, please, we're number 13 on Podcast Alley. We got to be in the top 10, man. Come on. <laughs> you'll, you'll hear that, right? Some shows can be that way and others, you know, not so much. I've always found that Alistair Stewart, when he does his donation plea, is always fairly clever and fun, to tell you the truth. I really enjoy it when he somehow 
turns whatever it is that he's saying into a plea for donations, no matter how far-fetched that turn may be. So I suppose it doesn't have to be pathetic, but considering who's doing the begging for the donations here, it's likely to be pathetic. I but please, I hadn't asked. please donate, folks. We could really use your help. It wasn't even supposed to be a segue oh. into begging for donations. Oh. Well, I'm going to make it one. I just thought I would talk about that just briefly. It meant my segue would be into these other podcasts where you hear that. Uh-huh. And they said they have a script and they, they follow it every single week. Now, I know that there are very successful podcasts where people actually get money and all that. But then I've heard podcasts that go so far where they're like, folks, unless we get some money, God is going to call me home. And she's like, what? Wait, what? He's like, we have until Unless we get money. March 30th. We're going to kill a bunny. Do you want me to kill a bunny? I, 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 I couldn't ever sink like that. I would try and be funny. Now, I know I fail <laughs> in my attempts to be funny on the begging for donations. But it, it did work for this guy. He was shameless. And he was number two or number three yeah. on the list of... He's going to be walking on that show pretty soon, whatever the frick that means. I suppose we could open it up for comments. If you guys find it to be shameless and awful and hard to listen to and you wish you didn't have to and you could, you wish there was a, like a chapter skip so when it gets to begging for donation you could skip right past that, I suppose you could let us know. I know there are – like Abby listens to the show. Liz listens to the show. I think Julie listens to the show and they are all podcasters. Lots of times I have these questions and I don't know what the answer is. And if we had Alistair Stewart in the room, whatever he'd say, he'd sound damn smooth when he says it. And we'd take it to be the truth because he has that accent. Right. So it seems authoritative. But he could say that he hates having to ask for donations every week. Or he could say, no, that's just part of the job. You have to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just it's something that occurred to me today because I felt embarrassed for the DJ. (laughs) And I think he's an all right guy. You know, he's he's like brought in his daughter who's like six to – co-dj with him he's yeah. like okay so say she, she begged for votes for him too she's like please don't let them take my daddy away <laughs> yeah it's rough there man and the yeah. guy's like do you want me to kill the bunny if you don't vote for me i'll kill the bunny what is that it's from that south park episode from the first season where they were on the bus and the bus drivers oh like following that's the instructional video for bus drivers and like if you have threatened to kill the bunny then the next thing you should do is this that's good i had forgotten but yeah miss crabtree yeah anyhow i digressed for a long time i've kept you from what you most desire and now folks for your parsec consideration part two of our irrational fears discussion wow you're really gonna go there huh you care to uh, fill them in if they're just joining us okay it's basically a follow-up to an episode that we'd done, uh, geez, it's been like two months now, huh? Talked about irrational fears. It was an episode in October, and it was one of those that got people interested in chatting, and so they all jumped on the website and left comments, and so we went over some of these comments, and there was so much to say about it that we had to cut it in half and finish again this week. So here we are, part two of Irrational Fears. Take it away, gentlemen. Oh, wait, I can't really refer to us as gentlemen, can I? That's stretching it a bit. Moving on. <clears throat> Number 30, the idea that your seatbelt will become jammed. That would suck. You mentioned that earlier, but the whole your car goes into a river. And right, whatever. that's Now imagine like you couldn't that. unsnap your seatbelt and the uh, the car is as, Yeah, water. that would be even worse. But that's probably many. And the car is filling with water. And it's on fire in the water. And there are fish. (laughs) Yes. There are fish that are swimming past and brushing your legs. I think somebody out there listening to this podcast just freaking had a stroke right now. (laughs) We just overloaded the brain and one half of it just shut down on them. (laughs) Number 31 is kind of related. Automatic seatbelts. Oh, is that the ones where you close the door and it like slides across you know that might be related to the whole claustrophobia thing maybe yeah because they come on to you you know right on without their you own. asking them to <laughs> that, that was the complaint of every girl I've ever gone out with but uh, for that one day that you went out with them with <laughs> cousins count right oh gosh number 32 earwigs 
earwigs themselves don't freak me out, but I know also know which comment that this is referring to. Because I remember him saying that just the word earwig freaks him out because he thinks of a bug going into his ear. And he said, I've always been freaked out about this ever since I saw Star Trek II. Okay, so let's move on to 33. Oh. The Eels of Seti Alpha 5. This is Seti Alpha 5! <laughs> Those things freaked me out. I saw that movie when I was a kid. I was a little kid at the time because it came out a long time ago. See, we went to see this movie as a family. It was a double feature, and there was this crappy kids movie beforehand that we'd all wanted to see. I think it was called The Pirate Movie, I want to say. So we went and we saw that movie, and aha, uh-huh, it was funny and goofy, and it was really bad because it was made just for five-year-olds, basically. And then Star Trek II came on after that. And, you know, that's a pretty early on scene when they stick the uh, those eels of Seti Alpha 5 into those guys' ears. And, oh, I could not handle that. It just freaked me out, and I cried about it to my mom until they finally took us younger kids and left the theater. I'm pretty sure the older kids stayed behind and watched the rest of the film and then came home by themselves after. But, yeah, for months after that, I would have bad dreams and stuff about these things going to my ears, and, oh, it freaked me out. Now, you always say that you're glad that you left when you did. Yeah, I I saw it years later when I was a teenager, and yeah, these things then took over these people's minds, and they became slaves to these freaking earwig things. That that would only have made it worse if I even found out what happened. I thought they just died, but no. You know, it was as bad as Creepshow when I watched that and had nightmares for years afterwards. It was rough. You know, I think Wrath of Khan and Creepshow both came out in 82. Did they? Uh, number 34, the metal band Striper. I am deathly afraid. Or or any other Christian rock band, to tell you the truth. Okay. They they had an album that was called To Hell with the Devil. (laughs) You're laughing, or are you crying? (laughs) Those are one of those things like Monchi Cheese from the 80s. That is not cool. They need to remain forgotten where they were. Luckily, I am here to remind people of both Manchi Cheese <laughs> and Striper. And the theme tune to Mr. Belvedere. <laughs> Freaks on the can of the before who cares. <laughs> the world's worst theme song. Okay, here we go. Uh, we didn't even mention it in our show about theme songs either. No, it got we? cut out. It was meant to be at the very end because I just go, <laughs> gosh, is that right? Is that how it went? That's the <laughs> shittiest thing I've ever heard. Uh, Number 35, men who wear black socks with shorts. (laughs) That's pretty scary. What is it about that that is frightening? Or is it just ugly? It's really ugly. Okay. And the guys that are wearing them are usually frightening guys, too. Also, nearly but not quite as bad is men that wear white socks with suit pants. This frightens you? (laughs) See, I have no fashion sense at all. Uh Uh-huh, I've noticed. But so, yeah, I just, I, I don't really know what's wrong with the whole white <laughs> socks and the suit pants. I try not to do it because my mother, you know, freaked out the 800th time that I wore white <laughs> socks. Yeah, it just looks bad. But you do understand the black socks with shorts thing. Well, I understand the ugliness of that, yes. Okay, at least you know that. Okay, number 36. Paper cuts. You know what has always made me wince for the longest time is just the... The thought of a paper cut on your eyeball. Oh, <laughs> sir. I don't know where that image even came from How in my mind. How would that happen? I don't It would have to be some kind of torture or something, I would suppose. But just the thought of it. You can see me squirming over here. I'm freaking out. The, the squirming and the... the, the There's this running and squirming. <laughs> paper cuts on your eyes. Uh, 37. Worms living inside cockroaches. Is that real? He said that he stomped on a cockroach and there were these white worms wriggling inside it. Oh. Now maybe that's its young? Oh. Oh, who? We've got a reaction. Make here. it stop. I hear I, that a lot. I don't even want to know about worms living inside of cock. Cockroaches are bad enough. Some of them fly. Okay, number 38. Mutants in the wake of nuclear disaster. We don't need another hero. Hmm. I think a nuclear disaster is bad enough. 
good. I don't even need a mutant to be worried. All right. I think mutants are kind of cool, but... They are. They, they kind of make the nuclear disaster a little better. Not not so bad. Now, the guy, the Pakistani guy that ran the, the little corner mart in our town that had three thumbs, is that... Is, is he a mutant? Is that a mutation? Possible. I don't know. Maybe he had one of those grafted on, so that wouldn't necessarily... I mean, it all depends on where the third thumb originated. It was on the tip of his nose. I, I, okay, it was, it well, was, he had two thumbs on one hand. Well, no, I'm just saying, was he born with it, or did he go out and find a good plastic surgeon to attach a third thumb because he thought it would be useful? I, I actually didn't interview the guy. I was oh, too well. busy running in terror. Okay, well, I can't tell you whether he's a mutant or just a freak. It's a fine line, isn't there? <laughs> there is. For example, I've never been called a mutant, but... All right, uh, now 39, this one's a little strange, that something will happen to Josh R's kid. Yeah, I have that fear, too. Although not so much Josh R as big A. Well, I, now see, I wouldn't want anything to happen to Josh's kid, because we want him to continue to do voices for us. yeah. There are very few kids out there that I actually wish harm upon. But I think unlike you, there are actually kids out there that I wish harm upon. <laughs> not necessarily death, but I wouldn't rule death out. But not Josh. He's he's a friend of the show, and yeah. uh, his kids are probably really cool. Yeah, I'm sure. Maybe someday we can get them to do voices for us, too. We'll have to see. Or at least edit a show for us. Maybe we can get a sweatshop going over there at his house. <laughs> All right, number 40, jellyfish. They are kind of creepy just because of the jelly. And they sting. Kind of like stinging insects. The idea of jellyfish doesn't frighten me. The sharks frighten me. Yeah, much like more than alligators jellyfish. or... Well, just, Barracuda. Barra you know, even like piranha don't scare me because... Well, yeah, they're, that's they're not real happen. to you, yeah. Yeah, the jellyfish yeah, but, is, is just as not real. I was in South America. See this, this guy right here? Mm -hmm. Okay, piranha's real. Okay, you can put your pants back on. <laughs> Number 41, vomit. Here, Stan, this is for you. Blah, you! You know, I'm scared of communicable vomit. One time I was in a bus, and somebody was on the bus too, and they vomited on the floor. That was nasty, and the smell didn't go away. But it was much worse when the second person vomited <laughs> I had to get off that bus before I became the third person. <laughs> that's scary. Wow, that's a good story, <laughs> man. Now, I was going to share, uh, just this year, my sister has a, a, a one-year-old, and she was just, like, playing with him, and she was throwing him up in the air, and she was holding him above her head, and he puked right into her mouth. <laughs> that's and she awesome. just went... Aah! And sat him down as fast as she could and then went running for the bathroom and I saw it happen and I was just like so proud of my nephew man. <laughs> you wished you'd but, had a camera rolling because I, I would have won you Funniest Home Videos $10,000 prize it was revolting but it was much more funny now if it had happened to me I guess <laughs> yeah you would have been just revolted just the, the uh, factor yeah, of it and all that someone else is vomit in your mouth now this kid was old enough to have been eating solid foods and stuff. This wasn't just like spit up, right? Yeah, but he's a baby, you know. It's not the. It doesn't matter, dude. Baby's poop stinks just as bad as adult poop. Baby's vomit is just as chunky with hot dogs as adult vomit. It's gross. Okay, well, see, vomit. I'm not particularly really afraid me. of it. You, you know, to tell you, I mean, you, you haven't even had that much of. You know, you haven't even had this experience yet, but. Oh, I vomited. More no, than you, no. sir. Once you become a parent and you have to deal with cleaning up, you know, I used to be deathly... <laughs> I don't even know if I need to go here or not. You used to be <laughs> deathly afraid of uncircumcised penises. No. And now you just love them. I was going to say, I used to be deathly afraid of getting poop on my hands. But now that I've changed a gazillion diapers in my life, it's happened way too many times and I can even count. And I'm not so afraid of it anymore. And the same thing is with vomit, you know. Dude, nobody wants to clean up vomit. But after the hundredth time, it's just not as big of a deal as it used to be. And you just take care of it and you wash your hands and you move on. Well, you, you know. tell that to the person who put this as one of their fears. Well, well, you know, they can be afraid of what they want to, but that's my take on it. Okay. We're uh, in the home stretch, folks. Ooh. 
Oh, wait. I'm sorry. I had this paper upside down. We just started. <laughs> Number 42, drains. Specifically, that you will get sucked into one. Oh. Uh, see. See, now that's irrational, isn't it? That is, yeah. Getting sucked into a drain, I'm not afraid of. Okay, me, yeah, me either. I, going down I like the drain. drains. Uh, drains are useful. They are. You know, the water goes away that way. Blood, I was thinking. Oh, yeah, that too. Bloody vomit, actually. That's good that that goes down there, too. You might need to see a doctor. I, I, <laughs> I was just compounding fears for people. <laughs> see if we can give somebody else a stroke. <laughs> uh, number 43, escalators. Specifically, that you will get sucked into one. <laughs> Getting sucked into an escalator, you know, that doesn't really scare. I, I don't know. I, apparently, the, this has actually happened to people in the past, getting dragged into the... That's how Sonny Bono died. Really? No. Oh. You know, <laughs> I love that part on Mall Rats where they, that kid is playing by the escalator. He's going to get hurt. And then, of course, at the end, ah, this kid got sucked into the escalator. It was on the news once, I think. There was video of an escalator that broke and suddenly... It went like 10 times its normal speed. And this thing was chock full of people. And all of a sudden, it's going downhill at like 40 miles an hour. And all these people are getting chucked off of this escalator. That, I think, is more scary to me than getting sucked into one. Because uh, I guess it's not any more possible, though. Okay. You know how when you're walking with a little kid on an escalator, they have an innate fear of yeah, the where top. it ends. <laughs> yeah, how do, It's just because kids are a little clueless. They just don't understand to step over it for some Why, reason. Everybody's gotten their shoelace caught in an escalator before, right? I haven't, but I'm oh, we're that's but possible. not all perfect like you. <laughs> I suppose <laughs> that's possible, but I think kids are more scared of it just because of the likelihood of tripping and falling down over that dang thing. Because that's oh, easy okay. enough. I, don't I think know. I assumed that it was the fear of meeting one's demise. Okay, number forty-four. The number forty-four? Are you serious? Okay, sorry. Go on. We've been here two hours. Come on. Apparently. Number 44, people who know the second verse to the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> if they're not members of some branch of the military, then yes, I am a little scared. All right. Much worse, though, people that can't even get the words to the first verse right. I'm sorry, but that's pretty messed. I was at a sporting event just last night, and the woman singing the national anthem screwed up twice. And she didn't even know it. She just went on through it without even realizing. She said flight instead of fight. And I can't remember what the other one was. But anyways, yeah, that sucks. <laughs> Seriously, dude, get the words right. Especially if you're performing it in front of 20,000 people, you know? This isn't the naked gun. Get it right. Enrico Palazzo, ladies and gentlemen. Number 45, kelp. I don't really even know what kelp is. I know whales eat it or something like that. And you know what's worse is my mom, at one point, she was really into herbal remedies. And she had kelp pills that she would take. And I have no idea what that's supposed to cure. Like I said, I don't even know what kelp really is. So I guess I can't really be afraid of it. Ditto. Okay. <laughs> Number 46. Now, some of these are just strange. Yeah. Number 46. Shower curtains. <laughs> Maybe they're afraid of being killed and wrapped up in one and dumped in the uh, landfill. Dude, have you been following me around? I thought that was a pretty good plan. Okay. Might say something about, like, their marriage, what state it might be in. I don't know. <laughs> what? What state of the United States? or No, what state their marriage might be in as to whether their husband might be on the verge of killing them, wrapping them in a shower curtain, and dumping them in a landfill. <laughs> now, is it... The whole psycho thing? Is that what those shower curtains Could be. Are? I don't know. It's... Is it the idea of maybe getting wrapped up in one or caught or smothered? Maybe it's the, the yeah. claustrophobia thing. Yeah, maybe it's like uh, shopping bags being put over your head kind of a thing. Number 47, garbage disposals. <laughs> You know, I am a little scared of that. I don't remember what movie it was, but I saw a movie where, holy crap, was there tension built on this woman reaching into the garbage disposal to retrieve something. And I, I can't remember what it was, but I would say Freddy was right around the corner with his hand on the switch. And you're just like, when is he going to turn it on and chop her hand into ribbons? And they kept 
playing that suspense and playing it, and then they didn't ever go there. And you know, it's, it, it was kind of fun that they did that. They just left you there freaking out, and then she pulls her hand back up. Oh, I got it. Here's my ring. Oh, dude, I know I've seen that movie too, <laughs> but I can't too. remember what it is. But yeah, I am a little scared of garbage disposals. Not in general, because they're rather useful to take care of your garbage, but. I am afraid of getting my hand chopped up in one because you always have to reach in there to get something out. It happens way too often. It's always some piece of silverware or something that goes down in there. And what often happens is your whole friggin' sink is full of like four inches deep of water, as murky as something from the sewer, so you can't even see what it might be. You just have to reach in there and feel around. What is, oh, there's the spoon that's making the garbage disposal freak out. You know, the whole idea of reaching into some place <laughs> that you can't that see, that's actually scary to me. It's Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. <laughs> Right. When Indy tells Willie to reach in and find the fulcrum to release them from that spike and of course chamber. It's full of bugs. And and yeah, she just can't see and, and just has to reach into that. That's <laughs> scary. And Add to that, the place that you're reaching into is full of spinning blades. That makes it even worse. Okay, so, so that's probably not a I think it's a valid fear, but you know, how many people get their hands chopped up? Oh, dude, it has to happen a lot. I'm and sure what, it the happens worst thing is sometimes. they put the switch right there by the light uh-huh. switch, oh, yeah, too. Nice. <laughs> that's twisted, man. Dr. Mengele came up with the floor plan for all the... <laughs> nice. Okay, number 48. Spiders coming up out of drains. That is a little... Fr- I think that goes along with the whole cockroaches thing and invading the guy's house on Creep Show. That does freak me out a little bit. I'm not so much scared of spiders, but cockroaches, yeah. It's weird because there are spiders that are deadly, you know? There's not several just of them that live in the world, but in the United States. And yeah, I'm more afraid of cockroaches. <laughs> we have black widow spiders. Black widows are effing scary. All over. I- I've killed several of them around m- my house. There's also a spider that's called a hobo spider that lives around here. And I swear, I saw a very large one of them once on our basement window. And you're scrotum. <laughs> no, the very large thing was something else in that case. Sorry. Hobo clown. <laughs> but yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw a very large one of those once hanging by our basement window. And I did kill that as well. And yeah, I'm still more scared of cockroaches. It's not fair. <laughs> it's not fair. Cockroaches are just grosser than spiders. <laughs> that's the problem. You know, uh, the only thing in the insect world that's worse than a cockroach is a maggot. Maggots are gross. They I, are I would like, disgusting. I would hold maggots for a movie. Cockroaches, I, it would have to be a big <laughs> check, my friend. Man, one time when I was in high school, my parents were out of town during homecoming week. And we basically had a party at my house, and uh, a whole bunch of food was left in the sink. And I, my parents were out of town. I wasn't going to do the dishes. So the dishes all sat in the sink the entire week with this food. Meat, I'm sure, was part of it down under there. So my parents came home from their trip, and they're like, All right, get in there and do those dishes, because... You left them there that whole time. We are not going to clean those up. So I go in there and I pulled off the top layer of the dishes and the food underneath was absolutely swarming with maggots. And the smell that came out of there physically gagged me. I staggered. I was going to say I ran out, but I didn't run. I staggered out of the kitchen into my backyard and dry heaved and retched all over my back lawn because it was so disgusting. So I would have to put maggots above cockroaches in the most disgusting insect category. But yeah, cockroaches are just so gross. We're going to have to put some kind of disclaimer at the beginning of this conversation. (laughs) This is really effed up stuff. Warning, today's episode may cause you to have a stroke. (laughs) Okay, number 49, snakes coming up out of toilets. Abby was talking about... Did she talk about an alligator coming out of a toilet? No, it was just, it was a massive, it was oh, in, it was oh, in that's right, meters, like a python so I, yeah. or something coming out. Of, that would freak me out, especially if you were using it at the time. <laughs> Seeing a snake coming out of your toilet is one thing, but having it first tickle you on a bum, that would scare me. I used to be afraid of alligators coming out of the toilet when I was a child. I don't know how the freaking alligator would get into your toilet. Well, it's Tiny not like you lived hole. in New York where that's prevalent. Right. 
Wasn't there like a movie called Alligator? Something like a TV movie called Alligator that's about an alligator in the sewer? Yeah, it wasn't a TV movie. It was a it was a real it movie. It was a real movie. I, didn't we talk about this on an episode? Maybe. If we did, it certainly didn't make the air. <laughs> but Robert, Robert Forster starred in this alligator movie, and I, I had a chance to meet him a few years ago, and I told him there's a scene where a bunch of like bully kids make this kid walk the plank. The oh, alligator cool. is in the pool. And it's at night and they make him walk the plank and he's like, no, no, I don't want to do it. There's something that down there. And they're like, you will walk the plank. And he's on the diving board and they make him walk off and the alligator eats him. And I told Forster, dude, I was so I, – I can't swim in a swimming pool at night even as a grown-up. <laughs> and he says, you have no idea how many times people have told me that. <laughs> that movie effed up a lot. Yeah, too. that's funny. Yeah, you know, I just heard – I never actually saw it. But I think I remember seeing commercials for it. But yeah, we used to play in the park behind my house, which I think I mentioned earlier when we talked about the uh, bubblegum ice cream. It was a little bit more nature-friendly park than your normal park. I mean, there was – streams running through this park and ponds and etc and these ponds ended up going into sewer pipes that went then under the neighborhood and sometimes me and my friends would actually see how far back into these pipes we could go because they were big i mean for a little kid to get into it was easy we would fit in there really well and we would go back pretty far but at a certain point that idea of an alligator in the sewer would come to my mind and that was it i was out well see kids are fearless man I wouldn't dare crawl into something like that. Too, yeah, as an seriously. Adult. Now, granted, I'm fat, but just the idea of spiders or the idea of slithering <laughs> things or the idea of finding a skeleton down there or a homeless man or a mime, just the thought of something in the dark with me and all that stuff, I can't take that kind of crap. Yeah, and alligators. And uh, did I not mention alligators? <laughs> Okay, we're almost done, folks. Number 50, people with tattoos on their face. Yeah, you should be scared of that. If someone has a tattoo on their face, that means they're either part of an Aryan gang or some other similar gang, pretty much. So that's what they uh, generally represent. So if you're not scared of someone with a facial tattoo, then either you're also in the gang or you're just dumb. Fair enough. Number 51, splashback. Now, I don't know what that means, but Sarah put it down. Is that like is public it? urinal kind of talk? <laughs> That's kind of gross. Is huh? that Well, what did you think of? I don't know. What, was that the extent of the comment? All she said was splashback? These two words, yeah. And so, yeah, I think of those. Now, if you're a woman, you probably not experienced one of these. But there are these pl <laughs> places, and it's usually just run down really gross, you know, yeah. train station kind of things, where they have just Rest a off. big trough or a, a section of the wall that is one huge urinal. <laughs> and men just line up, and there's no individual stall or individual pisses. Shoulder to shoulder. And you just all go, and, you know, everybody take three steps back and go as hard as you can. <laughs> um, or if you don't want to three three steps back... You're right up against the wall, and there's the threat of splashback. <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, I went to Candlestick Park for a Giants game, and yeah, they had one of those troughs. It wasn't a wall one. It was like a horse drinking trough. Or so. It was like a really long bathtub that you just stepped to and you just peed in this thing. And it kind of had, I guess, water kind of always running through this. Feeds right into the drinking fountain. When, when I talk about shoulder to shoulder, if you've been to a baseball game, or, I mean, there's 50,000 people or whatever, probably not. But anyways, there was a lot of people there. So in between innings or whenever it is that people are going to take a piss... There's a lot of guys in there, and I was eight years old or whatever, and there's all these big old beer-drinking dudes that they're just freaking opening up the fire hose in that thing because they've drunk so much, and I'm just sitting there going, holy crap! Just opened up the freaking hydrant on you, man. That's yikes. Splashback, I'm not just, just peeing in one of those things. I'm scared of that. Okay, but something tells me this is not what Sarah was talking about. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> they don't have. Okay, women's restrooms have couches, lamps, they have and flowers, and they have toilets with like carpeting on them, and, and yeah, let's see, reclining toilets, toilet lazy boy type toilets with a hole in the bottom. They have scented towelettes. That's right. But, but so what? What could splashback be? I don't know. Damn it! I'm we're going to have to do another episode. Sarah's going to mention what splashback Maybe. is, and we'll set a whole whole nother hour aside maybe it has to do with vomiting in some way Doom -chink! number 52 hedges 
No, that one, uh, I'm not afraid of hedges. There's only one thing I could think of when she says hedges, but it, nah, she couldn't be talking about that. Maybe maybe it was a labyrinth made by hedges, and she's actually afraid of the minotaur that's in the labyrinth. Yeah, let's just, just skip that one. I, I don't get the hedges thing. Number 53, tartar sauce. <laughs> more afraid of arby's sauce wait what is arby's sauce? horsey sauce isn't that what I they call it horsey arby's? sauce is gross what is is it that it has horseradish I in it is that why it tastes bad i think it's basically it's horseradish but they call it horsey sauce instead well half is made into glue and the rest goes right to arby's all right we're at the end of our list folks number 54 also provided by sarah Long, deserted hallways in hotels. That could be spooky. I can't help but think, when she mentioned hedges, I thought of the hedge animals in The Shining, mm. in the book. And the long, deserted And the hallways, long, deserted hallways has to be from The Shining, right? Yeah. What about the old lady in the bathtub in Shining? Wasn't that mentioned, too? Yeah, I didn't know that that needed to be mentioned. The, the hallway thing, there is something scary about that, especially when you're in a... Especially when a you're riding very... a big wheel down it. <laughs> Come and play with us, Piggy. At the Doonstay Audio Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. They were little limey twin girls. Oh, got to do that again. No, especially a very long hallway because the perspective or the light or whatever does kind of play tricks with your mind. Now, in between my junior and senior year of college, I got to do an internship in L.A. and I stayed at UCLA in the dorms. And because it was summer, they shut down half of the dorm and, and just crowded everybody into the other side. Uh-huh. Less and to clean or whatever. Less to clean or less trouble or intercourse or I, I don't know. It wasn't like the other side was off limits, but there was just nobody there. It was empty mm-hmm. and they would turn the lights off. And sometimes I would come out of my room and you could look and a and, and long, long <laughs> stretch of dark hallway where there's not supposed to be anybody. And yeah, I got to admit there were times, you know, you get up in the middle of the night to number 41 and uh, Splashback. there you go. <laughs> and it, it, there was something chilling, something ominous about the long hallway stretching out into infinity and you can't quite see what's there but something could be watching you or i don't know the shining is a scary scary ass book uh-huh. man and uh, the kubrick film is so scary just you know I, I have a friend his name's jeff and he embodies the idea of irrational fears <laughs> so <laughs> this doesn't really mean a lot to tell this story but when he was in his first year of college, he was staying at the dorms, and he used to have a serious bladder problem, so the guy would have to pee all the time. So he gets up in the middle of the night to go pee, and he comes walking out, and he goes walking down this dark hallway towards the bathroom, and he sees this shape stand up from the other end of the hallway, and he screamed like a friggin' little girl and ran for his room. <laughs> Turns out later somebody had their dog there, and it was just like a golden retriever down at the end. I heard him coming and went, oh, what's that? <laughs> but why that was there? I mean, I can understand a little bit being freaked out by that, because in the middle of the night in a freaky situation, <laughs> when something is out of place. Grr, arg. So that's the end of our list then, huh? Yeah, you know, I think I went a bit overboard on this. Uh, it probably should have been 10 or uh, an extended 20 list. No way. All right, so there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that. You'd better have. I guess that's it, huh? Until the third chapter of Irrational Fears. Oh, Affairs. gosh. Yeah, perhaps. You never know. This <laughs> is the third chapter, isn't it? Because we did a first chapter before we ever did this whole thing. Okay. Irrational Fears. A new beginning. Oh, no. All right. So, uh, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, that's I'm, the end of our show. I'm, I'm sorry. I know it's the end of the sh- our show. I, I'm Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Dan Clovis. And I, I was rambling, and I don't know if we even should have used any of that. And now, now the show is over, and uh, it ends on such a down note. But, I mean, that's what life is. A series of down endings. All Jedi had was a bunch of Muppets. See you later, folks. Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. 
The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Take two. And he has an uh, arm of a bear. <laughs> That's so awesome. And the ass of an ass, oddly enough. You know, probably by the time this airs, people will not remember life unexpected. <laughs> that guy's walk-on part will already have been canceled. Yeah, I was glad that kind of thing happened. The episode that he was in, this never aired episode that you can see on the DVD. I've never talked about it on the air, but I've told you uh, that I was on the set of this show, Kitchen Confidential. That was a Fox show the day that it got canceled. And it was an unexpected thing. You know, they still had like three more episodes to go on their contract. Uh huh. And Fox was just like, no, I guess they called the producer and pulled the plug right before it was time to go to lunch. And <laughs> people were so upset. And Bradley Cooper, who's like a big star now, he stormed off and he got on his cell phone and I, and they broke everybody for lunch immediately. I was like, uh oh. And I saw Bradley Cooper out in the parking lot yelling at his agent. Yeah, when we came back from lunch, it's just like, okay, well, this is the last episode. And when we finish up today, it might even have been on a Friday. It's like, when we finish up, we're all done. Whatever prop you want to take. I, that, to me, was weird. But, you know, it's just like, <laughs> we're going to tear this thing down over the weekend. Thanks, everybody, for all your work. And let's go get drunk. And that's what it was. To me, that was a really eye-opening experience. And you hear about the way Fox treats shows. Yeah. yeah, that would suck. Because even if it's a bad show, and I don't know that Kitchen Confidential was, because I never yeah. saw it. I've never heard of it. But even if it's a bad show, there are people putting in 10, 11, 13 hour days, working their asses off on the... Sorry, next week is the cursing show. Working their tukuses off. And the, you know, that's worse. <laughs> really working hard on these things and it's people that have families people that have drug habits people that have things that they need this money and yeah. suddenly they have no job it's like oh no what am i going to do next week kind of thing and you know bradley cooper did okay but these other people you know yeah it's gonna happen they're all turning tricks on the corner these days there were some handsome women on that show too i wonder where these tricks are being turned <laughs>